to uh, even the time of Christ, which we're going to look at some more tonight, but that led to eternity. And so God, it, none of this was by accident. Uh, the way that the tabernacle was built and all these details, folks, it's, it's important because that's what we have, forward to look, we have to look forward to in heaven. And so even though you might have been like me and get excited about heaven, the point of the lesson last week was how perfectly God's word fits together uh, and how important every word of it is. Or at least I wanted to make sure that we talked about that as well. Yeah, exactly, because what we're going to see, and we're going to see part of that tonight, is how what God did from the, in the beginning there is actually will occur uh, at the end times and even in heaven that we see because we had the correlation between the tabernacle, Holy of Holies, and the uh, new Jer city of Jerusalem. And so how God brought that down and the similarities between the two. So this is all tied together, and I think tonight, after you see what we have to present, hopefully it'll build your faith as to why the Old Testament is important, that it goes along with the New Testament, and how it fits together. It just didn't happen by chance. It just didn't happen. <laughs> now, remember, we've walked through the first uh, sacrifices, and we're going to look at some more sacrifices. So uh, we're going to be in uh, Exodus chapter 29. But um, remember, we had, uh, we had one bull, we had two rams, and we had three things of bread. And we walked through each one of those and what those meant and those sacrifices. And, um, uh, but that was to prepare the priest. And that was all about the priest being prepared. And now we're going to move on to the next group of sacrifices that will take place. And so, um, Brother Bob, do you want to set it up? Do you, how, how do you want to do this here, Brother? Well, th this is one of those nuggets that you find in the Bible. And you, you, I, I often call it hidden, <laughs> but it's really not. But it's one of those things that we don't get the impact of when we read this. And when I saw this several years ago, I thought, that's got to mean something. And the more I looked at it, the more I was amazed at how it tied all together again in the New Testament. Uh, so uh, if we're going to go ahead and read yeah, it, and then we'll... Read and let's, do, uh, uh, let's go ahead and do uh, Exodus chapter 29. Let's read 38 through 42. In other words... Um, we might as well just read the whole thing. I yeah, that'd be fine. Let's just read all the way through 46. So 38 through 46. So Exodus chapter 29, verses 38 through 46. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. And with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of an hand of beaten oil, and the fourth part of an hand of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof, for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I'll tell you, and Bob, I'm really glad that we're going to break this down, but uh, to me, once we leave here, I always find it so interesting that you read things like this, and most of the time, we just scan right through it and move on and say that we've read Exodus chapter 29. Uh, but what you just said there a minute ago, you found this nugget that was in, in God's Word. I think it's all throughout God's Word, and whenever we take time to slow down and study what it says... I think that it makes a big difference. And so, right. And by the way, I've got those copies anytime you're ready for them. Okay, we can go ahead and hand those you're out. Uh -huh. Let me just say here, in verse 45 and 46 here, is what we saw last week in Revelation 3, where God had planned to live with his people. He said, I'm going to be your God, and, I'm, and you're going to be my people. And that's what he says in the new Jerusalem as well as when the, we talked about the tabernacle that they're building 
uh, at this, you know, that's what we're going through, the building of the tabernacle. Uh, and so we see that correlation between what God is trying to do is live with his people. Right now, only the uh, high priest can go in once a year to the Ark of the Covenant in the well in heaven in the new city of Jerusalem will all be there. We'll be in the Holy of Holies. We will live in the Holy Holies. We'll be able to go in before the Lord. We will be like high priest at any time. We don't have to do... I mean, that's where we're headed. <laughs> that's what we got to look forward to. And he makes much the same statements. God makes much the same promises here in Revelation uh, 21, 3. And by the way, I want to hit on what Bob said there. Don't miss that because it is... The, the whole process of this is because God wants to be with you. And it's sin that separates us from God. He can't let that around. But he has such a desire to be with you. And you cannot miss that point. He loves you that much that he's going to go through all this so he can be with you. That's right. Really amazing with the way we respond to him. And Amen. so I won't go, that's another type sermon. But anyway, uh, how we neglect and not glorify him uh, in so many ways. But let, let's go through this. Let's look at this. When you read this, this talks about two sacrifices, a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening, a lamb at, at twilight. So what does that mean? That means every day a daily sacrifice. And what you have there, the handout, uh, came out of the Mishnah, which is the narrative for the priest to perform different things uh, and the Mishnah had several parts to it. The Talmud was uh, for blessed uh, blessings, special blessings and rituals. The Tamid, T-A-M-I-D is what we're going to look at and that was for the daily offerings. So this information I have here, I, rather than having to type it up myself, I happen to find that I have to give him a credit for it now. It's from the uh, agapibiblestudy.com. Uh, I had to get permission to copy this. At 5 o'clock, I got that this afternoon. Five, five so, o'clock today, they were trying to you can use it. So. Uh, but I have to give them recognition for what they have compiled here. And it's very good. It saved me a lot of time, obviously. Now, when we look at this here and these two lambs, God has ordered them to sacrifice. This actually started the priestly day. Now, these are burnt offerings, and they're praise and worship to the Lord. Uh, and let me just tell you how that procedure goes. And if you look at this here on Jewish time, they worked from the first hour. This is going to be the beginning of the first hour, third hour. And this actually is from dawn which matches up with the Roman time. Because when we start talking about Christ and his crucifixion, we need to know which time we're talking about. So we see these times here. And these lambs, can you guess where the lambs came from? Come on, somebody got to know where these lambs came from. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. I was going to say you. Oh. You. <laughs> Bethlehem. Does that surprise you? Not really, does it? But they provided the lambs to be sacrificed. And what they do, they bring the first lamb out in the morning at 6 o'clock. And they would tie that to the altar, to the horns on the altar. Y'all remember the big altar that we looked at had those old horns, and we talked about what's the purpose of those horns? Had one on each corner. Would you, Justin, can you raise this so we can see the cross? I'm going to tell you about that altar. Does anybody see the altar? Do you know the cross as an altar? An altar is a place or a, a structure or an instrument used for sacrifice. Do you know the altar in the tabernacle was flat? This altar is 
vertical. Why? Why would you think this altar is vertical, the cross? Why is it a vertical altar? Bob's wanting to say something I can tell. It's God offering up himself. Between earth and heaven. Do you know this altar has four corners? Can you find the four corners? I see a few shakes. The four corners are there in the center where the comes together. It would be pointing towards Christ. Do you know where the horns are? One on each corner. There's four horns. There's four horns. The top of it, the outside. Those are actually called horns of the cross. And in Luke 1, 69, it says Christ was the horn of salvation. Luke chapter 1, verse number 69. Luke chapter 1, verse 69. The altar that we had in the tabernacle that was five cubits by five cubits by three high, which is seven and a half feet, square top, seven and a half by seven and a half, uh, four and a half feet high. Also, uh, this represents the framing. That altar it was a finite wasn't it? What frames this besides our window? <laughs> what is behind all that? The sky. The, the universe. universe. Yeah, you're on the right track. <laughs> so to me, that's amazing how this actually represents the altar, but it's a different type altar it is a vertical altar it's to bridge that gap between us and God this just didn't happen by chance <laughs> did it okay so well if I go this slow I'm gonna be in trouble <laughs> so they would tie it to the altar to the horn at uh, six o'clock the first lamp and then they would inspect it. It would stay there for almost three hours, inspect it to see if there's any blemishes. And by the way, listen to what Bob just said right there. So they tie it and they inspect it for three hours to see if it has any blemishes. So they're looking to see if it has, you know, the wrong color hair. Does it have a hoof that is, is broken? Uh, and so they inspect this lamb to make sure it's a perfect lamb. That's right. For three hours. And the third hour, they would sacrifice that which is 9 a.m. in Roman time. Roman time is from midnight to midnight like we're used to. Okay? The sixth hour, they would bring the second lamb, and that happened to be noon. Guess what they're, where they're going to put that lamb? They're going to tie it to a horn of the altar. Right. And then three hours later, they're going to sacrifice that lamb. This says that twilight, they call. And according to Josephus and the Tamid, which is the uh, instructions for the priest, and it's still there. You can go out and look at that on the Internet if you would like. You can see a lot of stuff out there. I mean, they, But these are the instructions that the priest followed, and it would sacrifice at the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., so that is what is outlined here in Exodus chapter 29, these verses where they're read. That's what it's laid out. This is what Bob is talking about. Those right. two lambs that Bob read about, this is the beginning of laying out those daily sacrifices. When they sacrificed the first one at 9 a.m., they would blow the trumpet and open the gates to the temple. Every day, each day, continual. To mid means continuous, perpetual. 
and we're going to see the all in all to me, the one that actually completed and fulfilled uh, this particular offering. Okay. So let's look at Christ. And we look, if we looked at uh, John 19. Let's go to John chapter 19. Okay, while you're there, I want to read something to you, to you from uh, Matthew 26. And this is Matthew 26, starting with verse 3, verse 3 through 5. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him, Caiaphas. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they had to plan on killing him, but they weren't going to do it during the Passover because of the right of the people. But you know what? You remember Jesus, they had a chance to kill Jesus before that. But... What was it? It was not the right time. Do you know what? This is the right time. And there's nothing they can do about it. They're going to put it off, they think. Isn't that kind of amazing how God's plan is going to work? No matter what they think or what they plan on doing? Yeah. Whenever they, they, they could have, and they didn't. didn't. And then they didn't want to, and they do. Yeah. So God's will is going to be accomplished. That's right. It's pretty amazing to me to see how that's going to work regardless of what they think or what they do. Uh, these are evil men. These are priests. These are the people that should be leading them in the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> and here they are trying to kill the tr way, the truth, and the life. And then we go to John 19, starting with verse 14. Now it was the pre preparation day of the Passover. Now, preparation day of the Passover is actually <clears throat> the day before. When they talk about Passover, uh, many times this time they're talking also, you have to remember the Passover was killed on the 14th by the destruction of the Lord, I mean by the destruction of God, as he said in Exodus, Exodus 12, on the 14th. And then the 15th, that evening, you remember their days go from sunset to sunset. That evening they would have the Passover meal or the Seder dinner or supper. Okay? So he's talking here about the preparation day. And this happens to be with the Passover. What is the next day? The first day of unleavened bread, which is a high day or a Sabbath day. And I'm going to show you here in a few minutes kind of how that fits together and the timeline on that. All right? So if we look at the crucifixion here, and in uh, John 19, verse 14, I mentioned a Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said, Behold, your king. This is where he's condemned. And in verse 16, Then they delivered him to the to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. At six o'clock in that morning, he was condemned. This is when the first. What happened to the first lamb? Lamb. Right to the altar. Right, right. to the altar. That's six right. o'clock in the morning, the exact same time, six o'clock, when Christ was condemned. Okay. Now let's go to Mark. 15. Mark chapter 15. And we'll look at verse 25. And now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. What is the third hour? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning is when they crucified him.
verse 33 out of Mark 15. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Darkness here, ninth hour, that's when they tied the second lamb to the altar. Until the ninth hour. And what happened the ninth hour? In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. This is when he died. They did this for 1,500 years. And it happened just like God planned. To the very hour. I mean, isn't that amazing how God did that? We know he would, but I mean, it just surprises us that all this is tied together. And for 1,500 years, they've been doing this. Now, what day was that on? The Passover. I want to show you something else here. I hope I'm not erasing it and having to put it back up. <laughs> Ruth did this, by the way. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> okay. now, now that you're almost done, I'll help. <laughs> well, this was on the 14th. And what was the month? 14th of Nisan. Nisan. And that is the first month of the Jewish calendar. And how does it begin? With the new moon. And it changes every year. This year, that was March 27th, which happened to be a Saturday. And the next day is the Sabbath day, the first day of unleavened bread. And then the last day, the seventh day is a holy day, a Sabbath day. All right. Now, this coming year, it's going to be on April 15th. But there's one, one. And so we see everything working off of that with a new moon. Uh, and I, don't, I find that real interesting. I track those days and so on. But this is a Friday, and the next day, of course, would be a Saturday, and that's the Sabbath. In fact, it's got two of them. It's got the weekly and the high Sabbath from the Days of Unleavened Bread, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this doesn't happen every year because the 14th will fall under a different day. It's got one of seven days it's going to hit. So the next day is the 16th. Boy, that's tough, and I'm going <laughs> to Sunday. That Sunday happens to be the day of first fruits. Now, it does not always fall like this where you have these two sub Sabbath days together. Because if Passover had been on Monday, then Tuesday would have been the high Sabbath holy day, and we still will have the weekly holy day after that. Well, the day of first fruits is actually at the day after the, the weekly Sabbath. So, rather than being three days here, it could be five or six days. The, uh, Leviticus 23, if you want to read about these. Now, why is this important? Well, Christ rose on the day after the Sabbath which is the first fruits. And he was the first fruit. Isn't that pretty amazing? I mean, this all fits together there. Just like God instituted back 
when he was giving them the instructions. Yeah, if it would have been a year earlier or a year later, this wouldn't have happened. That's right. To this exact date. That's right. Now, they had been offering this. It tells them in Leviticus 23 to start offering this when they go into the promised land. So this had been going on for, again, almost 1,500 years. Sacrificing to this. And then here is the first fruits over here. Jesus is crucifixion. And he's the first fruit. And Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that whenever they came to tie that first lamb up at 6 o'clock in the morning, when Christ was sentenced or condemned mm -hmm. there was somebody else that morning that was going and tying up a lamb at the exact same time in other words the day that all this took place there was they were going through this ritual right then at the same time so on that third on that time whenever it went dark they were tying up the second lamb at the exact same time that it turned dark right. they were still going through their motions mm -hmm. even on that day when this was taking place the first fruit is always a Sunday. You remember I told you it's the day after the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, that falls within the week of unleavened bread. You know, I gave you the example, if this had occurred on Monday, then we would uh, have more days between Christ and the first fruit. So this matched up. <laughs> and a hundred or 50 days from this, 50 days from the first fruit, Pentecost. Pentecost. 50 days. And that's what Pentecost means. I, I do need oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the 50th day. And it is always a Sunday. Always. Always. The Holy Spirit came that day, wasn't it? And how many was saved on that day? About 3,000. 3, Do you remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and the golden calf was there? Within the Tempid, says it was the same day that the Holy Spirit, same day as the Holy Spirit was given to the people. So the day same day. Down with the Ten Commandments, which was when they had the golden calf. Golden calf. It was the same, same day. day. Mm -hmm. And what did Moses say to the tribe? He said, all that you're on the side of the Lord, come to me. And the tribe of Levi came to them. And he told that tribe to take out their swords and kill the offenders. Do you know how many they killed? I'm going to guess. About 3,000. <laughs> Did y'all follow that? That's pretty neat, isn't it? Kind of blows your mind, huh? <laughs> okay. Any questions By on the way, this? There's, and, and Bob, and I think you and I have talked about this once before, but let's talk through it real quick because you brought it up there. But the question had been asked, why were the Levites the ones that were the priests? And it very well could lead back to that statement where Moses comes down and says, hey, who's going to be on the side of the Lord? And it's the Levites that went forward and said, we're going to be... We're going to go with you, Moses, uh, and it's probable. Is it probable that that's the reason? Yeah, that's, they, that's what they are. They became the the priests or yeah. the Levites. It was going to be the firstborn, and then uh, God which changed that. It was that. going to be the firstborn, which would have been who? Reuben. Been Reuben, right? Yes, Reuben was. It been group. Reuben, uh, but. It was the Levites that stepped forward and said, no, no, we're going to be with, with God. And so the Levites became the priestly uh, nation. But it was them that killed the 3,000. And then 
1,500 years later, 3,000 people were saved. So this all occurred within the first month of the Jewish calendar. And James has got a question. Why did they quit? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my opinion, then we'll let Bob talk about, tell you the truth, okay? Did they, so they, they sacrificed. Wait now, they didn't quit. It's 1,500 years to this point, till Christ was crucified, approximately 1,500 years, because it's about 1450 B.C. when they exited. It's 1445 B.C. <laughs> uh, okay. when they exited that, and then Christ is uh, 30, 33 years old, we, we think, at that time. So it's about 1,500 years to that point. They continued to sacrifice up until the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And I want to tell you a little bit about that, too, because I want to talk about the Seder Supper and let you see how this actually fits in with that. Hey, and, and by the way, real quick, that's what I was, go I was going to say. I'm going to, I'm going to take a guess at his, at, and I was going to say that they kept going until 70 A.D. Um, and we've talked a lot about 70 A.D., but uh -huh. I, th I think that the destruction that took place there was a removal of that Jewish nation and the introduction of the church age uh -huh. began. I, Sunday I said it started at Pentecost, and it did start at Pentecost, but it really took off after 70 A.D. So this is the first month. This has occurred. Christ fulfilled that. He fulfilled the Passover. Now the next set of feast starts in the seventh month, Tishri, the seventh month. Why the seventh month? What's the number seven? Seven means what? Completion. Completion. And the first day of that is the day of trumpets, the feast of trumpets. It's when Christ returns. And then you have the day of atonement where they're confessing their sin. And the days in between are called the days of awe, where there should be cleaning up their lives each year. You know, they go through this ritual. And then we go on the 15th day of the seventh month, starts the Feast of Tabernacles. And that represents them living uh, in booths and so on while they were in the wilderness. Not only that, that will be celebrated during the millennium. The Christ 1,000 years. That is future events that actually have not taken place yet. Now, I'm not going to... Can you see how this occurred on the 14th Passover when Christ was crucified, which was the Passover day dictated 1,500 years before? And I'm not going to say this up too loud. When do you think the trumpet's going to sound? And we don't know. But the that day changes. <laughs> when will the Feast of Ingathering be? Is, I mean, it's really what you're kind of saying, right? Well, I'm really the day of trumpets. <laughs> That's when he would return. Yeah. Uh, I, guess, I guess I'm saying, you know, it might, we don't know what year or anything. But it fulfilled, this has been fulfilled to the day. To the hour. Yeah. We to the, it go yeah. down to the literal hour. And so what Bob is saying, if this fit together so perfectly, then Christ's return should come during that seventh month. It's not our seventh month, but during that feast of, of trumpets uh, should be the return of Christ. Well, you know, it says we don't know. Of course, we don't, we don't know. know. We don't know <laughs> and I don't claim to know. I have no special gift. <laughs> I don't have any insight. <laughs> but if this fit together so perfectly, then doesn't it only make sense that the second half of it would fit together perfectly as well? That I mean, is, uh, it started this year on uh, September 6th. And next year, it will be September 26th. Again, it's that new moon. Uh, the moon 
travels around the earth at 7.32 days for it to travel around in 27.32 days. But the phases of the moon is 29.53. 29 and a half days does the phase of the moon go from new moon back to new moon. I already knew that. I don't know if y'all did. <laughs> 29 and a half. Point five three. Well, anyway, the Earth spins counterclockwise. The moon travels counterclockwise. How do we see it rise in the east? Well, the Earth is turning faster than the moon. <laughs> it's traveling faster than the moon. So it's like passing a car. You could think that car was going backwards. Well, it's not. You're just going fast. But they're actually going the same way. So it takes 29, point, uh, 29 and a half days. That's why in the Jewish calendar, the first month is 30 days. You know what the second month is? How many days is the second month? 29. You remember me telling you? The third month, 30, 29, 30, 29, 30, 29. That gives you 354 days. Out of a 19-year cycle, they add a month seven times out of a 19-year cycle to catch up with the solar <laughs> But they still use that new moon. And that's why it's different and jumps around. So we never, I mean, you can, I mean, you can lay it out because we know how things work now. Uh, Greg, it's normally it's in the month of September. Uh, what month is it? It's typically around the, in September, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll fall into October, too. So the first month will go into March or April. Uh, next year it will... You know, I told the Passover it will be on the 15th. So that means it must have been around the uh, 2nd of April for the first day. Yeah. Okay? You want me to tie this to the Seder stuff? Let's do it. <laughs> Let me have you. No. You can erase that. Sure okay. I want to kind of go through this because this is just amazing to me. And one of these days, maybe we can have a Seder supper to get all the. And, and we really need a, a, a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, or a Jew that, uh, either way, we'll take a Christian, anyway, that knows the Jewish history to do that for us. And some of the things that really amaze me what they do. In Exodus 12, it tells the three things that were required. And that was bitter herbs. You know what the other one was? Another one? Unleavened bread, one more, the sacrificial lamb, right? Now today, they continue Passover, and the Orthodox Jews go through, and again, that's going to be uh, April 15th, and they have a Haggadah, which is a booklet that goes through, and they do singing and praying and participating and asking questions. And it's quite a long ordeal if you go through the whole meal. But they have, and I, I, these might not be in order, but I'll tell you what they do. Uh, they have a cup of uh, salt water, and they take a green vegetable, parsley or something, and that represents life, the life that they got. And the water represents their tears uh, when they were in bondage. And they will dip that in there and talk about them crossing the Red Sea. And then they'll dip it in again and talk about the Egyptians that came in and God covered them with the water with the Red Sea. And they'll taste that. And each, each member of the table will pass the uh, bowl of salt water around for them to do that. The bitter herbs is actually horseradish roots, normally is what they use. And if you had any horseradishes, you know it's pretty sharp. <laughs> It'll bring tears to the eyes. It'll make you cough and gag <laughs> if you overdo it. <laughs> that represents them being in bondage. And so they will take a matzah which is this bread, unleavened bread, and dip in that and take a bite of it. They also have a bowl 
of what they call sweet. And it has apples, raisins, and nuts in it, and some cinnamon and stuff, and it is sweet. And they'll take again some bread and, and eat that. And that kills that bitterness <laughs> that they got from the other. And so they go through that cycle. But here's the thing I want you to understand. <clears throat> they have a matzah pouch. They call it it's just a pouch. And it's one pouch. And it has three pockets in it. And they will put that matzah, or the, I call it flat bread. It's actually uh, unleavened bread, three different loaves in there. And what I've seen is kind of like a big wafer or cracker. And it's got holes punched in it. And it's got brown marks on it where they baked it. They will take that at the beginning of their service, the beginning of their supper, and take the middle one out. Now, they call that represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What would we Christians call that? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They take the middle one out. Why do they take the middle one out? They've just been taught that. If you're an Orthodox Jew, they take it and break it. My body is broken for you. They put half of it back in the pouch. They take this piece they broke off, wrap it in a linen, linen, and take it in another room and hide it. Like they wrapped it for burial and bury it when they hid it. At the end of all of this, they have the children go and look for it. And the child that finds it gets a prize. And they bring it back out. They pull it out. And they say some words over it. And they take it and start breaking off little pieces of it and passing it around. This is the last thing they do for food. Once they eat this, they can't eat anything else from that meal. Okay? Now, that bread has holes in it. I remember my mom, when she'd bake a pie and she'd take the crust and take that fork and you, any of you do that, you know, you stick a fork in it. And so it also had some burn marks in it. And no, they weren't burn marks, they were brown marks from the oven. What do you think those holes represented? Pierced. What about the brown spot? Stripes. Stripes. And it was unleavened. What does leaven stand for? No sin. What is it a representation of? They don't know that. Yet they're doing that. And they take it and break it and pass it, as I said, in about the size of a little olive, size of olive. Uh, it's, they pass around to eat that. There are four cups. The first cup is a cup of sanctification. They take that first. And that is to set them apart and set the stage for the, for the meal and everything is coming. The second cup is the cup of plagues. Or it could be uh, of suffering. And they take that. And they stick their finger in it and call out the first plague, turning the blood to water. And they drip that on their plate, and they go through all the ten plagues. And then they drink that. The third cup is a cup of redemption. To come. And after they eat this little piece of bread, the unleavened bread, they drank of the cup. Do you see what has happened here? Do you see where we get one of our ordinances? God or Jesus reframed that. 
Man, it's a perfect picture, isn't it? He reframed that. They go through and the last part, they have a cup for Elijah. And they pour wine in that. And they have a seat for Elijah. But Elijah is not there. So they send somebody to the front door to open the door and look up and down the street to see if Elijah is coming. And they come back in and say, no, Elijah is not coming. Why is that? If you remember in Scripture, God said that there was said that Elijah would announce Christ's return. They're looking for Elijah to return. And what did Jesus say? That's right. So they didn't recognize John the Baptist as being the one that they didn't know who it was. But that was Christ told his disciples, and the disciples got it. So they're still waiting on Elijah. Elijah's not coming. At the end of it, when Elijah doesn't show, they said, we'll gather again next year on this day in the city of Jerusalem. And this is where they had. Now, on their plate, they don't have a lamb. They haven't had a lamb since 70 A.D. Because they had to take it to the temple to sacrifice it and had to have a priest to sacrifice it. So they have a, bo a shank bone from the lamb on there. For our lamb, the lamb of God, has already been there, has he? But I find that so amazing that the Orthodox Jews go through that, that whole red and, and wine ceremony, which God reframed. And when did he do that? He did that, which we'd have to say, on a Thursday night. Because he was the Passover lamb the next day. Do you remember he had that with his disciples? If you want to look at Luke 22, it tells that in there. We don't understand why it was on Thursday night, but he had his Passover meal with his disciples on Thursday night. Some say, we call it the Last Supper, some say that wasn't the Passover meal. And maybe it wasn't, but we do get this ordinance of breaking the bread. And he said, and drinking of the cup, it, it, which represented his blood of the new covenant. And he said, what did he say? As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you do this, it was no longer the 14th. It was no longer the 15th. See, they actually had the meal on the 15th, the evening of the 15th, which was the start of the next day because it was sunset to sunset. I better In part of my study about the weddings this week, I, I, I talked about weddings and how much I love weddings, but part of the, the culture then, if um, whenever the, the bridegroom was going to go get the bride, he would say, and he would toast the, the dad, he would say, I'll not drink of this again until I come with my bride. And so what that's Christ a, said there, exactly. uh, but I just, it didn't work into the message, but when you're talking it, about that, it's, that's, that's exactly that's what, what it he is. says to them is, hey, I'm not going to drink of this until uh, we do it together. That's a picture of that wedding as well. Yeah. What a great, but is, wasn't that good? Let's appreciate Brother Bob. Uh, Oh, thank you. Um, and we had a Seder supper planned uh, for, it was like March of almost two years ago. It, right as soon as COVID hit, we had a guy scheduled that was going to come and uh, going to do that. So when you said that, I need to get him back on the, yeah. Back on the calendar. Yeah, you'll yeah. love that. It's really amazing, the detail that goes into that. These Jews really have a good history. <laughs> They just don't they, get it. They don't understand it. <laughs> Amen. And the more we know about it, the more we see what's how, going on. How can they miss it? Yeah. You think, uh, yeah. I mean, I hope you find this interesting because we tend to, you know, we take a lot of this for granted and we don't understand 
uh, these different things. But God had a plan. He had a purpose. And it all fits together. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Brother Bob, thank you very much. Anybody got any questions, thoughts? Craig? You know, I often wonder how they did that. I really don't know. Because you would have, we know there were 600 and, uh, 603,550, you know, when they went in the, uh, that was a man. Now, this was by household. So, it depend on, you know, household. And if your neighbor couldn't afford it, you can invite your neighbor over uh, to or take with you and, and go through the ceremony. So, boy, there would be a lot of lot of slaughtering. There's a lot of slaughtering. That was probably with the money changers. What the money changers would do, they would convert this foreign currency and make money off of it, and then they would sell them the lambs because they came out of town, and could, and then they'd make money off of that. So they were ripping the people off. And if you remember, Jesus went into the temple. He actually went in there twice. He went in right before this, the week of the Passover. He went in there and clean it out, you know. And he did that once before, uh, back early in his ministry. But that's what was going on. They were a lot of slaughter. Wayne? Uh, in that movie, Standing Around on the Roof, mm -hmm. uh, you see a lot of Jewish traditions and things in there. I don't know how much of it was true but, or accurate, but at the very, very end, when they're being driven out of this house, Says, oh, this would be a good time for the Messiah to come. Mm -hmm. uh. And it's so sad because he's already come, but there is this thing. Yeah. Which we would say this would be a good time for the Messiah to come again. <laughs> again. Amen. <laughs> good, good lesson, Brother Bob. Thank you very much. Anybody else got any questions or thoughts? Storm. Storm. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're doing the sacrifice. Christ is dying. The veil is tearing. All and it's dark. And there's thunders and there's earthquakes. Uh, and and then later, just like two days later, Christ rise right, raises. But it was more than just Christ. There were others that that got up and walked out of their tombs. I mean, there was some crazy. I don't understand how they missed it. They just didn't get it. I was talking to our Sunday school class uh, this past week because uh, we think it was power and authority. They could not get over their power, their authority, and their tradition. They were so ingrained. And if you do this year after year after year after year, you know, for these several hundred years, uh, you lose focus. You just kind of can go through the motions. How many of you have driven here tonight? And what did you see on the way? Well, I don't remember. <laughs> well, that's kind of, they, they just went through the motions and didn't recognize. In fact, they were, they were envious of him. They were jealous of him because the people responded to him. They didn't like that. Amen. It fits together so perfectly, God's word. Uh, when you, and anyway, let's have, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, Lord God, we come before your holy throne, thankful for this evening. Father, thank you for uh, your word that fits so perfectly together. And Father, even down to the very hour, you're an amazing God, and no one could, could accidentally write that in a book that fit together so perfectly. So we're so thankful for your word that you have given us. But Father, at the same time, I ask that we would be students of this word. That, Father, that we would commit ourselves to studying the depths of what you have in here for us to understand, to know who you are. And recognize that you have gone through such great lengths because you want to spend time with your children. Father, you're an amazing God, and we're so thankful. Father, thank you for Brother Bob and his lesson tonight and how, how um, uh, wonderfully he just put this all together for us. 
Father, I just ask you'll have your hand upon this church. Guide us into all truth. Lead us, Father, by your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.